Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, a couple things at the top before we go into Q&A. The President and the First Lady grieve the three lives lost at UNLV yesterday in yet another act of senseless gun violence. And our thoughts are with those who survived this incident and are, and are undoubtedly traumatized by this horrific event, including one survivor who sustained critical injuries. We are grateful for the brave law enforcement officers who ran towards danger and prevented further loss of life. At the President's direction, we have federal officials on the ground supporting local response efforts and providing all necessary assistance. The newly established Office of Gun Violence Prevention is also coordinating federal resources to help the community recover from this tragedy. Because we know it's not just the victims and survivors who need support, but this violence rips apart entire communities. And I also want to note that less than 24 hours ago, I stood at this same podium as we mourned the six lives lost in San Antonio. And here we are again today. When the president talks about ending the epidemic gun violence, this is what he's talking about. From Las Vegas to Texas to Memphis to Maine, when will, be en when will it be enough? When will it be enough? We are in crisis and we cannot continue to live like this. As the president said, Republican lawmakers must join Democrats in Congress to advance common sense measures to protect Americans from gun violence. Literally every day, every day we wait, becomes a, another day too late. Today, March, uh, today, um, as you have known, as you all know, we made an announcement uh, on new actions to promote competition in health care and support lowering prescription drug costs for American families. That includes a historic proposal to promote access to life-saving drugs at a price that Americans can afford. Taxpayers have spent hundreds of billions of dollars on research relevant to developing new prescription drugs. And more often than not, those drugs aren't available to families at, affordable, at an affordable price. President Biden thinks that is wrong, and we're working to fix that. Today, the administration is announcing a proposal to put drug companies on notice if they are not making their product available to the public on, a reasonable, on reasonable terms, including affordable price. This action would promote the federal government's ability to license a patent, such as those used to create life-saving drugs, to a competitor with the goal of increasing competition and bring costs down for families. Today's actions build on the steps the president has already taken to lower health care costs, including capping the cost of insulin at 35 bucks for seniors, finally allowing Medicare to directly negotiate for lower prescription drug prices, requiring drug companies to pay rebates to Medicare if they raise prices faster than inflation, and locking in $800 per year in health insurance savings for 15 million Americans under the Inflation Reduction Act. With today's latest step, President Biden continues to deliver on his promise to ensure that Americans have affordable access to medications, the medications that they certainly need. And very importantly, today we want to wish Jewish people at home and around the globe a happy Hanukkah and a meaningful festival of lights. This is an opportunity for Jewish Americans and all of us who support them to come together, reflect, share time with loved ones, and pray for more peaceful times ahead. The President and the First Lady are looking forward to celebrating Hanukkah with the Jewish community on Monday, and we'll have certainly have more to share in the upcoming days. With that, uh, as you can see, Admiral Kirby is here to uh, give an update on the Middle East, the Hamas-Israel uh, conflict, and also answer any other questions you may have. Go ahead. Global questions. Foreign policy questions. Go ahead. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think uh, we've all seen, I know you all have seen, the uh, recent attacks on maritime shipping by the Houthis, missiles and drones fired by them from Yemen, uh, and targeting commercial vessels. Now, these attacks represent a direct threat to international commerce and to freedom of navigation. They've jeopardized the lives of merchant sailors that represent multiple countries all around the world. And while they are launched by the Houthis, we certainly have every reason to believe that they're being enabled by Iran. As the National Security Advisor said just the other day, the Houthis are pulling the trigger, Iran is providing the guns. 
Now, Jake also talked about our efforts to explore the value of maritime task forces to help deal with this threat. And so today, I can tell you that the Departments of State and Defense are leading a coordinated effort to strengthen and expand the 39-member Combined Maritime Forces. That's a multinational maritime partnership which exists to counter illicit non-state actors in international waters, everything from just basic maritime security to anti-piracy and uh, um, trafficking. Our focus at this time uh, is ensuring that there are sufficient military assets in place to deter these Houthi threats to maritime trade in the Red Sea and in the surrounding waters to the global economy writ large. We're also encouraging other like-minded nations to join this coalition, and we've actually heard some interest from several key partners that are interested in, in coming aboard. Additionally, the Treasury Department announced today sanctions on 13 individuals and entities responsible for, for providing funds to the Houthis in Yemen. These sanctions will further cut off those who facilitate Houthi attacks, and they'll follow a number of sanctions on the Houthis in the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iran, that Treasury has already rolled out since the 7th of October. And of course, we are leading an international coordinated effort to condemn these Houthi attacks and their threat to global commerce, including what you, I think, saw in the G7 leader statement that we talked about yesterday uh, and through targeted efforts uh, through the UN Security Council. This is an international problem, and it demands an international solution. And that is exactly the approach that the United States is going to take to it. Now, lastly, I just want to make one thing clear, uh, that the commanding officers of our ships, our Navy ships at sea, have and will execute their inherent right of self-defense. And we don't have any conclusive information right now that suggests that U.S. Navy ships have been specifically targeted by the Houthis. But as we have in the past, so will we in the future take these missiles and drones down if we perceive a threat to our ships, our sailors, the ships and sailors of our partners, and of course, merchant traffic uh, in and around the region. With that, I take some questions. Yes, John, you talk about military assets in the region. Is the United States going to send more there? Or what, what all is needed there? Well, we've already bolstered uh, the presence in, in the region, particularly on the maritime side. Now, you have two aircraft carrier strike groups that are operating, one in the Eastern Med, of course, and then one uh, in, well, right now in the Arabian Gulf. But, but as you probably know, a, a carrier strike group doesn't sail like it, does in World, like it did in World War II. They're fairly disaggregated. Some ships and aircraft, obviously the air wing stays with the carrier, but other escort ships, some of the destroyers, they, they split off. And so, for instance, the ships that have been responding to these distress calls in the Red Sea, they belong to the Eisenhower Strike Group, even though the Eisenhower itself is in the Arabian Gulf. So I don't have any additional force posture to speak to, no announcements coming, but I do think it's important to point back to what the president has already done. And it's not just at sea. He's added additional fixed-wing aircraft uh, to the region and air and missile defense capabilities. We're always going to keep our options open, certainly not going to take anything off the table in terms of additional posture changes if, if it's required. And secondly, Putin was in Saudi Arabia this week, as we all know. The president of Iran is in Moscow for talks. Help us interpret this. What, what's, what, are, what do you see going on here? With the huge caveat that I, 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 am, I, I can't get between the ears uh, of leaders in uh, Iran and uh, in Russia, and nor would I try. What we have seen, Steve, in recent months, many months, is this growing, burgeoning defense partnership between uh, Iran and Russia. Now, the obvious, um, the obvious proof of that are, are the drones that Iran continues to provide Russia, and heck, they've helped Russia now create a manufacturing facility on Russian soil so they can build their own uh, Iranian model drones, uh, which are continuing to attack, uh, attack uh, the people of Ukraine and, and Ukrainian infrastructure. That said, and we've talked about this many times before, Iran probably wants something out of this too. And, I, and we have reason to believe that they want their hands on some sophisticated Russian military capabilities, attack helicopters, maybe fixed wing aircraft, <laughs> missiles, uh, crews and or ballistic. Now, I can't sit here and tell you that we've seen uh, actual evidence of the movement of those kinds of defense articles, but there's clearly a growing relationship in the defense realm between these two countries. And as I've also said, it's not only not good for the people of Ukraine, it's really not good for the people of the Middle East. And Iran, which can get its hands on additional military capability, some sophisticated capability, only uh, makes their destabilizing activity all the more worrisome. 
Uh, thank you, Admiral. It's now been about a week since the pause in fighting ended. Where are talks right now with regional partners to get another temporary pause? And what are the conditions that we know of right now of hostages that are remaining at that other American woman? Talks are still ongoing. Discussions are uh, happening literally every day. Uh, our team is in touch with our partners on this. I, I wish I had specific progress to speak to. I don't. Uh, obviously, the we're, we're not close to inking another deal on a humanitarian pause, um, and nor do I have any uh, news to break here today about the return of, of hostages, either ours or those of many other countries that are being held hostage. Um, we're still trying to get as much information as we can about the hostages that are being held. We have some information, as I said before, on some of the hostages because their families are talking to us, and that's been a terrific source of information and context. We have less information on others, but not for lack of trying. And after the failed vote in the Senate yesterday um, to advance the supplemental funding, what are the plans from the president to get this back on track? Any calls made to the Hill? Any, any uh, plans to work the phone? I, uh, I don't have any calls to, to read out. I don't know if Corrine does. Uh, I can speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I mean, we've been very, very clear about, um, about the supplemental and how important it is. As you've seen, the OMB director has been Pretty out, pretty out there on the different networks uh, making the case. Um, and one of the things that um, she has said is that it's stunning. It's stunning that we've gotten to this point, right? It's stunning that we have gotten to this point and that Republicans in Congress uh, willing to give Putin a, a, a gift, the greatest gift that Putin could, help, could hope for. That's what we're seeing. And so they are playing chicken with our national security. That's what we're seeing here. And history will, will remember them harshly. And so uh, as it relates to, to outreach, we've been very clear that we have, uh, had, have had those discussions uh, with them on a regular basis, and that, uh, but the path forward is very clear. The path forward is that they need to get this done. And you know, this is, uh, this is something that the President was very loud about and very clear about yesterday. When he spoke to the American people in front of all of, many of you and many of your colleagues, he, he made his message really clear. Right, that we need to get this done. Congress needs to get moving forward very quickly because we're running out of time. Now, our Office of Ledger Affairs, OMB, and SC are in close touch with lawmakers, as they have been for some time, with both parties, and about the need of this critical national security. Let's not forget, when we talk about a supplemental, we're talking about the urgency, right? It is an emergency. That's why we ask for it. That's why we ask for, for the extra funding for our national security. And so it's time for Congress to get this done. We have to continue, continue uh, to make sure that the brave people of Ukraine have what they need, they need as they are fighting for their democracy. And so I know the Admiral could speak a lot, lot more about that um, as he has in the past uh, two years, but that is, that is our focus here. And we're going to continue to be very, very clear, talking to uh, certainly both sides about the importance of this national security request. Over to you. You picked the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to add to it because I was like, No, no, I can't. <laughs> I could not possibly add to that. It was very, very. I was waiting. I was waiting for you. No, it was a very comprehensive answer. It was good. I... Um, on a quick housekeeping matter, do you have the readouts ready of the president's calls with uh, King, <laughs> King Abdullah and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu? Yeah, you'll see him soon. Okay. Uh, you'll see him soon. Uh, was there any significance to those ha calls happening today? Part of the regular outreach by the president to regional leaders uh, as uh, events continue to unfold uh, between. Israel and Hamas, uh, as we said, uh, as I said yesterday, he, you can expect them to be talking to Prime Minister Netanyahu soon, and of course he did. And now, has the U.S. independently confirmed claims from the Israeli military today that Hamas rockets have been fired at Israel from humanitarian zones? I have not been able to confirm that. Thank you, Karine. Uh, John, when the administration relieved sanctions on Venezuela's oil sector in October, uh, it was on the condition that uh, Nicolas Maduro begin releasing Americans uh, being held hostage there uh, by November 30th, which is obviously past. No Americans were released. It's December 7th. No, we're near political prisoners. Uh, wrongfully detained Americans in Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, what's the status of that sanctions relief, and what are the consequences for him missing that deadline? You know, we don't. We don't telegraph punches in the sanctions realm. We don't get ahead of uh, sanctions decisions, so I'm not going to do that today. Obviously, we always have that option available to us, but I'm not in a position now to, to rule anything in, in or out. Uh, deeply, deeply concerned that, uh, that those commitments weren't followed through by the evening of the 30th. And staying on Venezuela, um, 
Obviously, since the invasion of Ukraine, the administration has said that it's committed to uh, protecting, you know, territorial integrity around the world for nation states. And here you have Maduro threatening to annex 75 percent of its neighbor. Um, what is your public message to Maduro, and is there any private message being sent to Maduro about the consequences of this? Yeah, so again, I've said this before, but we obviously support the peaceful resolution of the border dispute between Venezuela and Guyana, um, and, of course, and we absolutely stand by our unwavering support for Guyana's sovereignty. The 1899 arbitral award that determined the land boundary between those two countries should be respected unless or until the parties themselves reach a new agreement or a competent legal body decides otherwise, and that hadn't happened. So we're going to urge Venezuela and Ghana to continue to seek a peaceful resolution of this dispute, including by the International Court of Justice. Good. Um, just back to the supplemental package that failed to advance last night. Has <coughs> anything since then been communicated by the administration to Ukraine? I guess um, what are they to sort of make of the fact that there is such an impasse on Capitol Hill right now? Without trying to speak for the Ukrainians and what their interpretation of what's going on here, and particularly up on Capitol Hill, as you know, uh, Ukrainian leaders were here in town yesterday over at the Pentagon for a defense industrial conference. We're trying to make sure that we get in place the mechanism so that they have a healthy defense industrial base and long-term uh, security assistance uh, built into their own self-defense because they're going to need it. We're, wherever and however this war ends. And uh, obviously the events of yesterday were certainly a, a context and background to that meeting. Um, uh, but I, I, I won't speak for the Ukrainians. I, I can only speak for us. And as Kareem mentioned, we're obviously deeply concerned about this. The, the, we've got a, a few more weeks here. And then we're out of Schlitz when it comes to helping Ukraine with this kind of security assistance that we've been able to provide. Um, and that's just, that, that should be unacceptable to everybody. And we know that there's strong bipartisan support up there. Uh, it's just that there are a small number of Republicans that want to hold that aid hostage for some pretty extreme border policies that the president is, is not willing to, to talk about. That said, he did say we're willing to negotiate in good faith. He does believe that there should be immigration policy changes as well as resource changes. And he's willing to have that conversation. At this point, can the White House offer any assurances that more, you know, additional funding is coming their way, or no? We are not in a position to to uh, to make that promise to to Ukraine, given where things are on the hill. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, John, there is a report uh, that some of the hostages who were being held by Hamas have been sexually assaulted. The AP is quoting a doctor who treated some of the hostages that were released, and he says that at least 10 of them, men and women, were sexually assaulted while they were in captivity. What do you know about this? Do you have any indication, any evidence that the hostages have been sexually assaulted? I got sort of a version of this yesterday. I, I can't confirm these individual reports and, and, and stories. They're horrific. Sadly, because of who we're dealing with, we certainly uh, aren't in a position to disabuse these reports. Um, and the truth is they're believable just on the face of it because of who these guys are and what they believe. Um, and because we have heard other accounts from other survivors that have come back and other hostages. Uh, and as the president said, I think very eloquently the other day, I mean, the, 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 uh, it's, it's inhuman uh, what Hamas has proven capable of. And that is all the more reason why we're working, as to the earlier answer I gave, by the hour to see if we can't get uh, another pause in place so that we can get these hostages home to their families where they belong. Now, obviously, we know that Hamas is holding some additional women and children. So let's get them out. And then we can talk about the other groups. We understand they classify people. Let's get the remaining women and children out and, 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 and get them out from under the jackboot of Hamas and potential sexual violence. So um, in terms of the, uh, the aid package yesterday that went down, is there any second guessing at the White House about 
the president's decision to put border security into the same package and therefore give Republicans in some way, a, you know, leverage to, to, to make one hostage to the other. You can't complain that they are linking the two issues since you link the two issues. Is there any second guessing about that? Was that a mistake? No. All four buckets of the supplemental, Peter, were of an urgent nature. Ukraine, Israel, we've talked about. The, there was also money for Indo-Pacific strategy, of course, with AUKUS and the developments of, you know, coming forward, trying to get Australia their nuclear-propelled uh, submarine capability, um, and then the border, uh, and some $6 billion in there for additional resources for the border. I mean, if you listen to the Republicans talk about the border and this, the urgency that, that, that they think needs to be conveyed, <laughs> okay, well... It was in our national security urgent request, $6 billion for the border. We share a sense of urgency, so act on that. Act on that. Okay. Um, thank you, Kirby. Uh, Congressman Michael McCall, the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, told Politico that PEPFAR reauthorization uh, negotiations are deadlocked. What is the White House sense of where that stands right now, and what's the administration doing to push that process along? And if it's not reauthorized, what are the consequences of that? Can the funding continue? This is a program that over 20 years has literally saved something like 25 million lives. Again, this, this, there is, without speaking to the negotiations on the Hill, and this is something that should be as nonpartisan as it can be. I mean, you're talking about millions and millions of lives at stake here. Um, so we urged them to find a way forward here uh, to, to reauthorize this funding. Is this something that we would see the president engage with lawmakers on, given what a priority this seems to be for the it is, a, it is absolutely a priority for the president. I, don't, I, I won't get ahead of his schedule or his, uh, or his phone calls, but I can tell you he's watching this very, very closely because he knows personally what, what a lifesaver this program has been. Uh, thanks, Kirby. Uh, one follow-up on Venezuela. I know you said you wouldn't telegraph on sanctions, but can you give us a sense of a timeline of when the administration will make a decision on sanctions rollback? That sounds a lot like telegraphing. No. <laughs> on, uh, one more. on the. Uh, I want to ask you about the uh, grounding of the Osprey fleet. Um, any updates on that? And I know some of them are in the presidential fleet. Uh, are there any special considerations being uh, discussed with them, and will the, what kind of checks will be required to uh, put those back into HMX. Well, I asked about this earlier myself because uh, I kind of thought you guys might be asking the question from that perspective. Uh, it's a force-wide stand-down, and that means every Osprey in the force. And these Osprey belong to the United States Marine Corps, part of the force, so they, they'll be subject to the stand-down too. Which, and this is a common procedure uh, when there's a significant uh, aviation mishap and when you might, when, when you can't rule out when an aircraft goes down, that there might be some larger systemic problem. It's common practice. It's the right thing to do. Put them all on the ground. Put them through an inspection regime. Make sure that you don't have rule that out as uh, as a problem. Maybe and so that maybe it's just aircraft specific, platform specific, and not necessarily the whole system. So, um, so they'll do that and. I have no doubt in my mind that they'll do it as expeditiously, expeditiously, but also as safely as possible. We won't let them back into the air until we know that we can do it with a, a, a measure of certainty. Um, John, as Kareem just noted, tonight at sundown starts the Festival of Lights, the Jewish holiday Hanukkah. Are there any specific or credible threats right now to Jewish sites or Jewish communities um, that you can share with us? And is there a message to those communities or any community in this country what they should be prepared for as we embark on the first of eight nights? I don't have any specific credible threats to speak to in the sense that, you know, to a certain locality or community or through a certain actor. What I can assure you, Peter, and the Jewish community is that we are working very, very hard at the federal level to analyze all the streams of intelligence we can domestically and overseas. Uh, for any spillover effects from the conflict in Gaza to here at home, particularly against the, the Jewish community as well as the Muslim and uh, uh, Arab communities here in the States. Um, and that we, more importantly, are working to share what we're learning and hearing with local and state authorities who would really be where the, you know, where the rubber meets the road in terms of trying to prevent. But we want to be able to, again, without any credible knowledge of a specific threat, we want to be able to identify it before an actor can move uh, and certainly disrupt that uh, as best we can. Does the U.S. have any concerns about Israel considering exploring the possibility of using <laughs> seawater to flood out some of the tunnels used by Hamas beneath 
Gaza right now. Among the possible concerns are, are there hostages in those tunnels? And also from the Palestinian Water Authority, I think it is, they say that this would have devastating effects on the aquifer that's beneath there that would make this land unusable in the future if it's to, you know, as it would be retained by the Palestinian people. Yeah, I can't speak to the reporting about this particular idea. I'd refer you to, yeah. I'd refer you to the IDF. I would just say that, as we have said many, many times before, while they go after this very legitimate threat, we continue to urge our Israeli partners to do it in a way, as Secretary Blinken said, how they do it matters, in a way uh, that minimizes the risk not only to civilian life, certainly to our hostages, or the hostages, but also to civilian infrastructure. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Um, the president last night uh, spoke about how he was fighting every day for the release of a number of journalists, and he included um, Alsu Kramasheva of Radio Free Europe in that list. If he's saying that she should be released and he's pledging to fight for that, does that mean that the president believes she is wrongfully detained, um, regardless of where the State Department process is? It believes that uh, it means that he believes that, that she ought to be able to do her job as a journalist and not be detained by Russian authorities. I am not in a position to get ahead of the State Department. As you know, Catherine, they are the ones that make the decision about uh, wrongful detention. And as I understand it, they're working their way through that process. Thanks, John. Back on Venezuela, uh, Southcom announced that it was going to be conducting flight exercises over Guyana today. Is that timing meant to send a message to President Maduro about U.S. support for Guyana and its territorial integrity? I'd be careful drawing too, too strong connective tissue between routine military operations uh, that we do in the region uh, in this particular issue. That said, uh, as I said before, we recognize the sovereign territory of Guyana, and uh, as we do with many nations, sovereign nations uh, in the region, uh, we, uh, we conduct operations and exercises as appropriate. How far would the U.S. be willing to go to show that support? Would it be willing to help Guyana maintain that territorial integrity? You mean militarily? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm not going to speculate about that kind of a, a thing. We, what I said yesterday stands. Uh, we want the internationally recognized border recogni uh, recognized. Uh, we want um, we we want these two sides to work it out uh, diplomatically. Uh, we've already expressed our support for the 1899 arbitral award, which set that boundary. And uh, and as I also said yesterday, we don't want to see this come to blows. There's no reason for it to. Thanks, Green. Um, John, is the U.S. in any sort of a conflict with the Houthis? In a sort of a conflict with the Houthis. We are not in an armed conflict with the Houthis per se. That said, as I said at the top, uh, we're going to do what we have to do to, pr to protect ourselves, our partners, and merchant shipping. And we've done it in the past. We'll do it again in the future. That sounds a little bit like a conflict. We are protecting and defending freedom of navigation. We're protecting and defending uh, uh, our ability to operate in the region, in the Red Sea and surrounding waters. And as I said at the top, we are looking to flesh out an already pretty robust combined maritime force to protect freedom of navigation in the area. And like I said, we've got a, a couple of, a uh, few, several uh, other countries that are willing to participate, so we look forward to that. Does the President have any regret for over delisting uh, the Houthis as a terror organization? Is he reconsidering that at all? I've already said that we are going to review that decision. Where? No, we are. I've said it. I said it a couple of weeks ago that we were going to take a look at that decision, and, and we still are. On the results. I, I don't have a date certain for you or any outcome to brief Jackie, but we said we we're already going to take a look and, and, and review that decision. And then on the uh, supplemental, the House Speaker said yesterday that the failed vote in the Senate is proof that Senate Democrats don't have support for their partisan position. What is the White House response to that? The president believes, I'll let Senate Democrats speak for themselves, the president believes, and he said this to you yesterday, that the immigration proposal, that's gone nowhere up on Capitol Hill. He also believes that border security needs to be enhanced. So it's for the president, it's both a policy issue, immigration reform writ large, and a security issue. The gap seems to be between what the president is offering, which we don't have many details on, and what Senate Democrats have been willing to put into a package. Because we haven't gotten a lot of the details on 
what that negotiation offers. Can you characterize any distance between, you know, what the president is willing to do and what Senate Democrats may not be willing to embrace? And moreover, should Congress stay in session until this is finished? Certainly, I'm not going to negotiate this thing in public. Um, there's probably a reason why you don't have perfect visibility into what everybody's saying behind closed doors, and I think that's appropriate. We're not going to we're not going to start negotiating uh, in public, and uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Leader Schumer talk about uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Leader and, and Leader McConnell talk about what they want to do in terms of the the session. Uh, we uh, we're working very very close with Senate Democrats on trying to move this forward, um, and. You heard the president say himself, he's willing to negotiate in good faith with the Republican side as well. But they've got to be willing as well. This is about compromise. And in a compromise, nobody gets everything that they want. Uh, and the president understands that from a long career in the Senate, and he's willing to have that as a starting point of the conversation with an understanding that compromise means nobody gets everything they want. But that's not what we're hearing from the House side, uh, the Republican side in the House. Uh, it's, it's kind of a take no prisoners approach, all or nothing. What we want, nothing but what we want. Uh, and that's just not negotiating in good faith. Thank you, Corinne. Um, John, on Ukraine funding, some of the experts that I've spoken to uh, say that one of the consequences of the funding not being advanced uh, may be that Ukraine might need to think more seriously about ending this conflict diplomatically. Now, I know you've said many times that it's up to President Zelensky and the yep. Ukrainian people when to start negotiating, but at this point in the conflict, and considering waning public support both in the U.S. and in Europe, can you just talk about some of the thinking beyond the calculus of a ceasefire versus a dragged out impasse? Yeah, Patsy, I, I, you'll be wholly unsatisfied by, by this answer. We, President Zelensky gets to determine how and when this war ends and under what conditions he's willing to negotiate with Mr. Putin. If you're sitting in his seat right now and, you're, well, and his troops, you're looking out across that front and you see a lot of Russians. Uh, you see a lot of Russians that are getting increased by, in size because Mr. Putin continues to recruit uh, uh, additional manpower and throw them into the fight. Uh, if you're looking across that battlefront, you're seeing a Russian armed forces that they're willing to go on the offensive. They're, not, they're probably not just going to sit in defensive positions all winter long. And so you want to be ready to take that on and you want to be able to not only defend yourself, but go on the offense. Um, he gets to determine what that looks like. What we want to do since the beginning of this conflict is make sure he has the tools to do that. And those tools are about to run out. And, and just uh, one more, John. Two more, actually, if I may. As we are in year end uh, season. To, <laughs> that's are, not up to me. <laughs> as we are in um, year end season, can you talk about foreign policy goals, focus, challenges, looking ahead to 2024 as the U.S. deals with? strategic competition with China, the war in Ukraine, and now this war in Gaza threatening to uh, widen throughout the Middle East. Uh, well, without getting ahead of the president, I uh, wouldn't do that. But I, 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 think, um, I think he would tell you that we uh, uh, have accomplished an awful lot on the world stage. And American leadership um, has been clearly demonstrated in so many ways across so many regions. Uh, uh, NATO is stronger and bigger. We've got uh, an increasingly networked and cooperative arrangement in the Indo-Pacific. And just today, Jake Sullivan's in Seoul meeting trilaterally with uh, Japan and South Korea. I could go on and on. Um, and I would expect to see in this last uh, coming la last year of this term uh, uh, us putting our foot down on the accelerator and pushing all these changes even, even farther forward. And just really briefly on the Houthis, uh, John, on these new actions that on these actions that you're taking, how should we see that in the context of the Gaza war? Do you feel that this is do you see this as a conflict widening via Iran proxies, or is this separate? It's a risk. Um, that it's clearly a risk to the potential widening and deepening of the conflict. And we said from very very early on, when the president ordered additional military capability, that we don't want to see any actor, state or non-state widen or deepen and escalate this conflict. And what the Houthis are doing could have that effect. And this goes to Jackie's question. Are we in a conflict with the Houthis? We're not in a conflict in the Houthis right now. We're not seeking a conflict with the Houthis. But what we are seeking is to be able to defend ourselves and to prevent this conflict from widening. And that's the better answer. I should have given it to you. <laughs> Thank you, Karine. Um, the UN has described the- It just takes me a while to get there. I just gotta get, yeah, sorry. It's okay. The UN has described the humanitarian situation in Gaza as disastrous and actually listed it's hell on earth. 
uh, the Secretary General activated Article 99, which is, have not been uh, activated since 1971. 1989, I think, was the last time. I think it's 70, well, okay. We right. can disagree on this, we'll agree. We'll go back to the facts. But anyway, the bottom line is, does the international community, including the United States, has failed the civilians in Gaza? Since the frustration had went up at the UN to the level of the Secretary General, to call for what happened in Gaza as a threat to the regional security. Everything we're doing is trying to prevent this conflict from, from widening, deepening, escalating, um, and having a larger effect on the region. And every, uh, many of the questions I've answered here today, I think, demonstrate all the things that the President is doing through his personal leadership engagement, including phone calls today with leaders in the region. Uh, to try to keep this conflict from, from escalating. Look, we certainly share the concerns that so many of others ha have concerned, including the Secretary General, about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Tell me, name me one more nation, any other nation, that's doing as much as the United States to alleviate the pain and suffering of the people of Gaza. You can't. You just can't. The United States, through President Biden, is leading the effort to get trucks, food, water, medicine, and fuel into the people of Gaza. Wait, wait. Name another nation. Name another nation that's doing is more than the United States to get hostages out or to get people, foreign nationals, out of Gaza. You can't do it. And name another nation that is that is doing more to urge the Israeli counterparts, our Israeli counterparts, to be as cautious and deliberate uh, as they can be in the prosecution of their military operations. You can't. The United States is at the forefront of this. Now, every single casualty, Israeli or, or, or Palestinian, innocent life loss, every one of them is a tragedy. And we mourn with those families. We say it over and over and over again because we believe it. And it comes from the heart. Uh, but we also have to remember what Israel's up against. A group, a terrorist group, that deliberately puts those civilians in harm's way and puts them in the crossfire of this fight. That's what the Israelis are fighting. That was my, not my question. My question is, are you doing enough? The United States is leading humanitarian aid all over the world. That's yeah. a fact. We know that. Okay, just quickly on another question. Uh, there was the but, seven but, images. Please stop you there. You said, are we doing enough? Yes. This we, is why he's frustrated we, with... Uh, even even through our leadership, uh, list, we believe there's more that can be done. And we're going to continue to do more. And we're going to continue to lead. And we're going to continue to urge other regional partners to step up their efforts, too. Because it can't just be the United States. And look, we are getting help. I don't want to dismiss that. Egypt, Qatar, Jordan, um, and of course our Israeli friends, uh, they've all been uh, contributing and participating in trying to get this aid in and hostages out. I want to give due credit where it is, but we can all be doing more, and the President is committed to doing that. Okay, just very quickly, there's disturbing images from Gaza, in northern Gaza, of, of people being arrested by the Israeli army, by blindfolded, stripped naked, some of them are journalists that we identify, and some are civilians. Israel is saying they're Hamas fighters, regardless who they are. Do you think that Israel is still acting within the international law and a treatment of prisoners? As I said, I'm not going to respond to every event on the ground and, and every occurrence. I haven't seen those images. Uh, it would be imprudent for me to comment on that. We don't, just as, a, just as a general statement, uh, we don't support any targeting of journalists one way or another, anywhere in the world. They have a, a right and a responsibility to be there reporting on this. We believe that they should be allowed to do their jobs, and we certainly don't, uh, would never condone a any inhumane uh, or violation of law treatment uh, of any innocent civilian. But I can't speak to those specific reports. Um, thanks, Karine. Uh, thank you, Admiral. Um, Reuters, AFP, uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty have all released um, separate reports today on a strike in uh, South Lebanon in October which killed one Reuters journalist uh, and injured six people, including two AFP journalists. Um, these investigations all say that the evidence uh, points to the uh, Israeli army being responsible. Um, what's your response to those reports, uh, and what's your message to Israeli forces in general for the protection of journalists in this conflict? We haven't seen uh, those investigations, and so it would be imprudent for me to comment on, uh, on them one way or the other. As I said in my earlier answer, we absolutely do not condone or support any deliberate attacks on journalists covering a, a war. They're already put, placing themselves in great danger by being there. We believe they have a right and responsibility to be there, and, and we would and continue to call on, uh, on people to respect that.
Thanks, Green. Um, thanks, John. Uh, John Finer was in India this week and met with the uh, external affairs minister and other Indian officials. Um, the readout said that he addressed the government's investigation into the alleged plot to assassinate a Sikh American on U.S. soil. Can you provide any more on that, or did he get any assurances or any t sort of timeline on when we would see this investigation? I'm not going to comment further on that. It's under active investigation. We've said that uh, we're glad that the uh, our Indian counterparts are taking it seriously and doing that. Uh, we want those uh, responsible for these attacks to be held uh, fully accountable, but. Uh, I won't get ahead of an investigation that isn't complete. Follow up on this, uh, what impact this is going to have on your bilateral ties with India? Look, India is a strategic partner. We're deepening that strategic partnership. Um, uh, they're a member of the Quad in the Pacific, um, uh, and uh, we participate with them uh, on a range, of, particularly of security-related uh, issues, and we, ex we want to see that continue unabated. Um, that said, at the same time, we certainly recognize the seriousness of these allegations. And as I said earlier, we want it fully investigated and those uh, responsible to be held, held properly accountable. And the president is still planning to travel to the Quad Summit in India next year? I don't have any travel to speak to today. Thank you, Karen. Um, so first, I have two questions, one on the war in Gaza. The Pentagon said today that the U.S. has now resumed flying drones um, over Gaza to search for hostages. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit more about if there's any changes in our efforts to locate the hostages in Gaza? Um, has it become more difficult or less difficult after the temporary ceasefire? It's always been a, it's always been di difficult to try to locate them, especially since uh, we don't believe Hamas holds all of them. We don't believe they're all being held in one group, and it's entirely likely that they're being moved around as operations are, are conducted. So that's one of the reasons why, quite frankly, that our drone flights can be valuable. It's just an extra set of eyes up there to, to kind of see what you can see. I won't, wouldn't dream of speaking publicly about uh, the details of those efforts or what we might be gleaning or not gleaning. I think the less said about our information, uh, the, the better, except to say, as I said at the very early part of this briefing, I think to Selena's question is we don't have perfect visibility on all of the hostages, where they are, what their condition is. And a quick follow-up on South Korea and China. You were talking about the meeting that Mr. Sullivan is having with South Korean and Japanese um, counterparts. Um, the State Department recently raised concerns over China's economic coercion against specifically South Korea, pressuring um, Korean theaters to block an American performing arts company called Shin Yun. I'm wondering during upcoming talks with counterparts there is China's economic coercion part of the discussion, and how concerns administration about that? Yeah. Well, first of all, we'll, we'll wait till a readout when Jake gets back and, and uh, figure out uh, what was exactly talked about, um, so I won't get ahead of that. The main purpose of Jake's discussions are really to explore ways to improve our trilateral cooperation across a range of things, but certainly in the security, uh, uh, security front. By that, I mean the defense-related military front. Um, but, you know, cyber. Space. I mean, it's it's all it's all the things when it comes to trilateral cooperation. I don't know of too many conversations that we've had with our Korean and Japanese counterparts where, in some form or fashion, China's uh, economic bullying uh, practices don't come up. So it wouldn't surprise me. But let's not get ahead of the meeting yet. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the, this new partnership with Mexico. Um, uh, Secretary Yellen in Mexico just announced a new partnership with Mexico to help improve screening of foreign direct investments. Um, I'm wondering if this is about restricting Chinese investments in, in Mexico, and why is this uh, important for U.S. National, national security? Well, first I'd refer you to the Department of Treasury for more detail, but just as a broad statement, we don't ask countries to choose between the United States and China when it comes to economic opportunities or investment. Sovereign nations get to decide for themselves. Um, and what we're focused on is the President's uh, Global Program for uh, Investment and in Infrastructure, PGI we call it, uh, which is really about offering alternatives uh, to some of the less transparent, less reliable, high interest loans that other nations uh, around the world uh, seem to be willing to, to proffer. But again, every nation has to decide for itself. Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much. All right. Um. 
Uh, two topics. Um, there was a ruling from a Texas judge earlier today that a lot of pregnant women whose fetus has a fatal diagnosis to obtain an abortion. And it appears to be the first time since the Dobbs ruling that a woman in the U.S. has asked the court specifically to approve an immediate abortion. So I wanted to know the White House um, response to that ruling or a comment on the expected appeal of that decision from the state of Texas. Yeah, so um, saw that ruling. Let me just first say that no woman should have to go to a court uh, to get the health care that she needs. That should not be the case. No woman should have to do that. So let me just start off by saying that. So we are glad that this person uh, uh, will get the care that uh, she needs from her doctor. Again, should be her decision, her decision to be made with her doctor, which is sometimes some really difficult decisions that women have to, be, have to make. And the, this is an administration that has been pr really clear about that fighting for uh, the rights for women to make decisions on their health care, and we're going to continue to speak loud and clear about that. But we should not get dis de we should not detract from the fact that stories like hers are becoming all too common in states uh, where Republican elected officials are enforcing dangerous extreme bills, extreme bills that threaten the lives of women. And so since that Supreme Court, as you just mentioned, uh, uh, overturned Roe v. Wade, adopts decisions, women are being denied medical care they desperately need in order to preserve their health and even save their lives. They've been turned away at emergency rooms, forced to delay care at r grave risk to their own health, left with complications that threaten their ability to bear children in the future, and made to travel hundreds of miles for medical care that they, that they need. So ensuring women have access to emergency medical care has been a core focus of this administration since the Dobbs decision, and we will gonna, we're going to continue to fight for that, and we're going to uh, make sure that uh, you know we're going to make sure that um, uh, providing uh, care and 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 giving uh, guidance to doctors and hospitals about emergency care that is required under federal law, uh, that we make sure that we provide that information as well. But this is administration has spoken loud and clear since day one. Since day one, you heard from the president, you've heard from the vice president, you've heard from me and others that we are going to continue to, uh, to fight for, uh, for women to get the care that they need to make these decisions on their own, these personal decisions that they should be making uh, with medical doctors. Uh, Non-immigration, if I may, um, yeah. I was wanted the White House to address, address the concern or the criticism from Republicans who said that President Biden has, in their view, used his parole authority too broadly. So obviously, the president has used his parole powers mm -hmm. in the administration to grant protections to, for example, Afghans after the withdrawal and Ukrainians after the war began. But Republicans are saying that this has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. So I wanted to know the White House position on those uh, criticisms from Republicans that he's essentially abused that parole authority. And we don't. We disagree. Obviously, the president has used those authorities in the way that uh, we think it's appropriate. Right? You just named uh, two ways that we we use it in ways in emergency way. Right? In a way that was uh, in, a, in a, a way that a. a, a a leader, a world leader, uh, would make sure that the parolee program is used in, a, in in situations where, you know, people are coming from dire situations, right? Dire uh, scenarios, and so we disagree, strongly disagree. Look, you know, Republicans uh, talk about uh, immigration reform; they talk about border security. Uh, the president. You know, on day one, the president put forth an immigration policy, right? He put, put forth a comprehensive immigration legislation to start that conversation, essentially to start negotiating on day one. It's been three years, and they have not been moving forward in good faith. They have not been trying to get to a solution in good faith. The system is broken. We want to find real solutions. The president said yesterday he, he's, real, he's willing to have a serious conversation about this. But they, they, where's the good faith? You know, somebody was asking about Speaker Johnson, right, and how he and his demands uh, for HR HR two, and let's not forget HR HR two is what Speaker Johnson and all and the House Republicans want to move forward with, right? And let's not forget what's in HR two, right? HR two forced the deportation of unoccupied children seeking refuge. It mandate detention of all families. That's the extreme. That's what we're seeing from HR two. That's not moving forward in good faith. So what would Republicans have to do to show that they are willing to operate in good faith on this subject in order for the White House to engage in negotiations? So look, they should have a conversation. 
with Democrats. Democrats have said that they want to compromise. Have that conversation, right? Just make that discussion. Have that discussion. Negotiate in good faith with our Democratic, uh, with our Democratic uh, leaders in Congress. Have that conversation. Well, there have been bipartisan negotiations taking place for weeks in the Senate. Are you saying that that's the proper venue for this discussion, not uh, discussions between Senate Republicans and directly with the White House? The negotiations has been happening and should be happening with Republicans and Democrats in, in, in Congress. That's what should be happening. And we want to continue to, 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 for them to have those conversations. But they're not moving forward in good faith. They're just not. And, you know, when you have a speaker demanding to push forth H.R. 2, which is extreme, it is extreme. That is not moving in good faith. And so that's what we're seeing. And let's not forget, you know, House Republicans voted uh, to cut 2,000 border agents. You know, they, they are blocking the president's efforts to secure the border and enforce the laws. Those are the things that they're doing. So where's the good faith? Where's the good faith there? So when Senator Cornyn says he thinks this needs to be kicked up to another level, direct talks between Leader McConnell and the president or his aides here at the White House, you're saying that's not going to happen? What well, we're saying that Republicans need to act in good faith and show that they're serious and they're not, you know, because they're blocking, right? They're blocking the president's request for funding. That's what they're doing. So that's what we want to see. Uh, we introduce, here's the thing. We, again, we introduce a comprehensive piece of legislation to deal with the immigration system, a broken system. We did that on day one. That was our, that was our effort to have that conversation, to ne negotiate and be, be able to put forward a piece of legislation that could be voted on. The president put forth his ideas and how he wanted to move forward. It's been three years. What they continue to do is block. What they continue to do is take away law enforcement, right? That they keep voting against trying to make the system better. That's not acting in good faith. Is there time to put together a deal this year? Are you running out of time? I to... mean, look, it is a, uh, yes, we are running out of time, right? We are running out of time. And that's why we keep pushing and saying, this national security supplement needs to move forward. We talked about Ukraine. We've talked about Israel. We talked, the reason we included the border security is because the president thought it was important and we needed those additional funding to move forward to deal with the issue at the border. So obviously this is an emergency, this is important, but yeah, we are running out of time. And, and would the White House accept a deal that designates Mexico as a safe third country? I'm not going to negotiate from here. I'm just not. I'm not going to negotiate from the podium. Get MJ. I'm Karine, yesterday when I asked the president whether he believed any other Democrat could defeat Donald Trump other than him, um, he said probably 50 of them. I'm not the only one. Um, a big part of the re-elect argument is that the president is best suited or uniquely suited to take on former President Trump. Um, if the president himself thinks that plenty of other Democrats can defeat Donald Trump, what would you say is sort of the driving rationale for the president running for re-election rather than handing off the baton to the next so, generation? So, MJ, as you can imagine, it's a 2024 question. It's an upcoming election. I just can't get into it. Um, uh, look, our focus is going to continue to do what we've been doing the last two years, almost three years, right, which is making sure we deliver our promise that we've made to the American people, uh, is to make sure that we have an economy that works for all, that works for the middle class. And we have, we have had some historic uh, progress here, right? When you think about the 14 million jobs that have been created, when you think about, even step even further back, when you think about what the president walked into, an economy that was in the tailspin and getting that back on its feet. So the president wants to continue to do that, continue to lower costs for Americans, continue to make sure that this economy is working for all. There's our democracy. He wants to continue that we're making sure we're fighting for our democracy. Remember, the president initially said something I can talk about in 2019 and in, in, in 2020 when he was running uh, for, for, for the presidency. He believed that our democratic values were, was at stake and he wanted to continue to, he wanted to fight for that because the soul of our nation was worth fighting for. And Americans believe that. Majority of Americans <coughs> showed that they believe that in 2022. So those are the things that he wants to continue to do in the next year, right? Um, 
but I can't speak to any specifics of, of, of you know, horse races or who's, I just can't speak to anything like that as it relates to 2024. Could you say anything more broadly about the idea of the president being a bridge to the next generation, just given that that's something he I mean, that's something he about. said, right? He has said his, himself in, during the 2020 election, right? That is something he, he has said. So the president believes that. But I, I'm just not going to speak specifically about any other potential candidates or, or you know, that could beat uh, the current, uh, the, the potential uh, Republican um, nominee. I just cannot speak to that at, at this time. Does the president have any plans to address the shooting that took place in Las Vegas when he travels there tomorrow? Yes, you could expect the president will address the shooting, the awful shooting that we saw at UNLV. Yes, does that mean going to the site or visiting with survivors or just at other remarks that will be public? I don't have any update to his schedule, but he will for sure, while he is in uh, Las Vegas tomorrow, address the horrific shooting uh, that happened at UNLV. Okay, let me ask you if I can. The Biden administration delayed again banning menthol cigarettes. Some public health officials, as you know, uh, blamed them for taking the lives of hundreds of thousands of Americans. The, the president had committed to doing that before the end of December. I believe, uh, in the words of the American Heart Association's National Senior Vice President, federal advocacy, if not now, when? So I have to be careful. There's a rulemaking process that's currently occurring right now. And so it, as it's going, as it's still going on, I cannot comment to this. I would have to refer you on the specifics of this to FDA, on this to the FDA. You can't comment on the I president's it, commitment to it do is, it by the end of December, not meeting it? There's a rulemaking process, and I just can't speak to it. That's just how it goes here when there's a rulemaking process. Okay. Easy. Uh, thanks, Craig. The administration is warning pharmaceutical companies that if the price of drugs are too high, then the administration might, the government might cancel their patent protections. So what taxpayer funded drugs is the White House specifically targeting here? So um, are you speaking about Marchin, the Marchin, exactly. okay, what we announced today? Look, uh, this is a proposed framework that we've provided for, uh, for how agencies uh, evaluate uh, questions around Marchin. So um, there's not, it's not about any particular uh, drug or forthcoming action, but again, this is a framework that we have uh, provided uh, for agencies and how they move forward. If the proposal is finalized, when and how would the administration plan to exercise the right? So I'm not gonna get ahead of, of uh, what agencies are going to be, how they're gonna move forward. I don't have a timeline uh, of that to lay out from here. Got it. Yeah, thanks. I want to ask you about Bidenomics. Um, you said it. The president, though, hasn't said the term Bidenomics since um, November 1st. Is he moving away from that I, term? Well, I didn't say that. Well, I you, said that. You said it recently. Oh, you, you mean I have said word, that. The oh, word okay, gotcha. The word I hear you. The so, my apologies. The president has not said that word since November 1st in his speech. Is he moving away from that term because it's not moving the poll numbers? So look, uh, let me just say, last week we learned economic growth was higher than 5%. I know this is something that you cover very closely, and 5% last quarter, uh, higher than any quarter under Trump outside of the pandemic. Uh, and inflation fell 3% with prices staying flat in October. So uh, what is important is what the data, what the data shows. Uh, the president has talked about how Bidenomics is threatening supply chains to lower costs and investing in America, clean energy, and manufacturing. In fact, he had signs right behind him just last week. I was there. I'm sure you saw them that said Bionomics. Uh, and uh, you've heard me, as you just stated, and many other uh, White House officials talk about how Bionomics is indeed lowering costs. Uh, let's not forget, taking on Big Pharma, right? So that Medicare could negotiate to lower costs, uh, lower drug costs. Let's not forget junk fees. All of this is part of Bionomics. All of this is, we're talking about investing in America, which the president uh, uh, certainly uh, has led on and talked about all the time very, very consistently. So when he talks about the economy, that is binomics. When he talks about what we're doing and how we're delivering for the American people, that is binomics. But then what's the disconnect between what people are feeling and seeing uh, at the grocery stores, at, at the tables, and what the president is saying about the So let me, let me just be real clear. We get into the holiday seasons. We've actually have seen a decrease in eggs, in bacon, in milk uh, since last year. So we are seeing lowering costs as we're going into the holiday season, as we're as people are going uh, to do some holiday shopping. We're seeing uh, lowering costs in, in TVs and things that people need to think about as, as they're going to give a gift uh, to their loved ones. And so we're seeing some costs go down, airline tickets, gas prices. So 
the work that we have done, the work that this president has done, the investing, whether it's investing in America, whether it's binomics, we're seeing that. We're in a different place than today than we were a year ago. We are just in a different place with costs going down. And, you, and I've t we've talked about uh, the, the growth is higher uh, than 5% last quarter. That is because of the work that we have done. We saw inflation is moderating. That is because of the work that we've, uh, that we've done. And look, to your press question about what Americans are feeling, we understand that we're coming out of a pandemic. What Americans had to deal with was a big deal. People, people lost loved ones. The economy was in a tailspin. Certainly didn't, wasn't helped by the last administration. This administration had to actually do the work. So, but inflation is up 17.7% since the president took office. You inflation just inflation, inflation fell to 3%. That matters. I just talked about the important goods that matter to the American people, how that's going down. As we're going into the holiday season, actually we started it, as we're going to go into certainly uh, Christmas in a couple of weeks and other, ho ho uh, other, event, other uh, important events that people, uh, certainly people follow uh, this month. And so we're seeing prices go down. And let's not forget the historic actions that this president talked to, that has done. I talked about Big Pharma. I've talked about the Inflation Reduction Act. That's because of what this president has done. And let's not forget, Inflation Reduction Act, only Democrats voted for it. Republicans decided not to. Again. Yep, yep. Thank you. Are you I'm surprised that I'm calling you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just one question. Does sure. Does the Department of Education have any guidelines to ensure that schools receiving federal funding have reasonable protections for students from threats of violence, harassment, intimidation as part of their code of conduct. So hmm. reasonable protections in order to get the federal funding. So I don't, I would have to go back or refer you to the Department of Education. That's such a specific question. So I just would have to go to the Department of Education because I don't know if which programs you're specifically talking about or how that works. So I just need to. Related go. to the university president's uh, testimony and how, you know, their the university presidents were saying that their codes of conduct may not um, hmm. designate any of the language, the infantata language, as um, against their rules unless it turned well, into. So well, look, I, I, as far as it relates to funding and how that works, I would have to certainly uh, refer you to the Department of Education. We have been very clear, you heard me yesterday, uh, about how we feel when, um, when we see hatred uh, the way that we have seen go up in, in a community like the Jewish community, anti-Semitism, we're going to call that out. It is unacceptable. We're not, we're going to have the moral clarity here. This president has had moral clarity on that. And so we're going to continue to be steadfast and call that out and say anti-Semitism anti is unacceptable. Ken Hello, Michael. Thanks, Corrine. Um, at DHS, there's an office called the Countering a Weapons of Mass Destruction Office. Mm -hmm. And its job is to protect major cities and major events across the country against chemical, uh, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. Um, on February 2nd, this office will disappear without congressional authoriza uh, reauthorization. And uh, it protects things like the Super Bowl, which is just a couple days late, later, February 11th. Is this something that the White House is prioritizing? Is it involved in ensuring that Congress fits this into some vehicle? I would have to talk to our Office of Ledger Affairs on that particular question. Obviously, um, what you just laid out is, you know, concerning, and we want to make sure uh, that communities are safe, and certainly events like the Super Bowl, people feel safe, and so I would just have to uh, connect with the Office of Ledger Affairs on that one. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, on immigration, you've mentioned several times this day one bill that the president put forth. Uh, my question is, would he be willing to meet with Republicans and have a meeting with them about that particular bill to make his case for why he thinks that that should pass? I mean, look, it's been almost three years. It's a comprehensive bill. You know, uh, lawmakers are on the Hill. You know, they know how to read a bill, right? They know how to look at the bill and pull from the bill what they accept and what they don't accept, right? And we did that on day one and have had multiple conversations from our side here, Ledge Affairs office, with members of Congress. This is something, can you imagine the first thing that this president does as putting forward a, a piece of legislation is on immigration, a comprehensive uh, piece of legislation? That shows, if anything, that should show how committed he is to that issue. And what we keep hearing 
from Republicans is either they use immigration as a political stunt or they try to make cuts, right? Or they vote against what the president is trying to put forward, right? Or they say, we want to take away 2,000 CBP agents. I mean, that's what, if you look at HR2, that's basically what it's saying. It's extreme. It's extreme. So we have a comprehensive plan, and they put forth a plan that is extreme. If he's committed to it, would he be willing to, to meet with them? And if not, why not? I, I mean, you're, you're, you're missing the point here. The point is the president put forth a comprehensive plan on day one, almost three years ago, almost three years ago, almost. And what they do instead is put forth extreme, extreme, extreme bills that does nothing, nothing to fix the broken system. That's the point. Thanks, um, Eric Adams is on the Hill today meeting with lawmakers to talk about the migrant crisis. Is he meeting with anyone at the White House? I don't have any uh, meetings to, to read out uh, about Eric Adams meeting with anyone here. I just, I would have to check in. I, I don't have anything for Has you here. Has there been any sort of progress or dialogue with mayors as, as they try and accommodate the influx of migrants? And I mean, look, we have been committed, uh, have certainly put forth um, uh, resources for mayors to deal with the influx of migrants. Uh, we have had multi multiple conversations. Our IGA office has been in close contact. Uh, there's been in-person meetings in states, in cities, uh, wanting to, to make sure that we hear uh, their concerns. And we've provided assistance. We have provided assistance. And so that's going to continue, right? That's going to continue. Um, and so that's why we're, oh, we're asking Congress for, for more. We're asking Congress to help us uh, in, in trying to deal with, with this broken, uh, broken system that has been broken for, for decades. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Go ahead. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, so Senator Joe Manchin, mm -hmm. um, who has openly left open the possibility of um, an independent rep president next year, um, has been heavily critical of the administration's rollout of the clean energy tax credits mm -hmm. and acted as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and last week, he, he also um, spoke against um, the Treasury and DOE's um, interpretation of foreign entities of concern that are a key component of um, eligibility for the tax credits. Um, I want to know if the administration had a response to this. Has the president spoken to Manchin recently? Um, and yeah, what did you make of his comment? So I'll say this. I can't speak to... Um uh, the senator's uh, potential or not potential run, that's something that he has to speak to for himself, certainly not, nothing that I can speak to from here. Uh, what I can say is that, uh, you know, we have had a very good working relationship with Senator Manchin. Uh, we appreciate uh, his, uh, his partnership. Uh, we could not have gotten the Inflation Reduction Act done without him, obviously, um, but just not going to not going to get into uh, anything else uh, specifically. Obviously, this is an issue that is important to the president when it comes to climate change, when it comes to uh, clean energy. This is uh, these are issues that the president has led on. He has had uh, the most. Um, uh, the most aggressive climate change agenda. When he walked in, he said climate change was one of the four crises that we've had to deal with. And that's what you've seen him do. You've seen him act on that. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you so thank you. Have a great, great weekend. And some of you I'll see you on, to, on tomorrow. <laughs>